Good morning. Welcome to our panel discussion about the science of uh, preserving the desert. I'm Mike Phillips. I'm the public affairs manager for the city of Scottsdale. I'll be moderating our panel today. Uh, you've got a, a great panel, uh, very knowledgeable about uh, their fields of expertise. I, I'd like to introduce uh, Helen Roll, the field institute director for the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy. Rachel Pearson, the Vice President of Community and Government Affairs at the Scottsdale Convention and Visitors Bureau. Bravo. <laughs> and Scott Hamilton, the Senior Trails Planner for the City of Scottsdale. As a backdrop to our discussion this morning, I'd like to show a, a short video about Scottsdale's McDowell Sonoran Preserve. Beautiful. Unique wild and rugged. The city of Scottsdale's McDowell Sonoran Preserve is like no place else. Just minutes from the heart of downtown Scottsdale, the preserve is a sanctuary for the untamed, untouched Arizona. A place where hawks soar and deer roam, where saguaro cactus forests reach to the sky and boulder fields inspire wonder. Scottsdale residents came together in the 1990s to protect this special place. They approved a series of taxes to purchase the land, worked with developers and the state to identify special areas for preservation, and formed the nonprofit McDowell Sonoran Conservancy to assist in the protection of what is planned to eventually be a 34,000 acre sanctuary of unspoiled mountain and desert land an environment that is unique to the American West and the world. This is a land of remarkably diverse geography, surprising geology, and inspiring natural beauty. It is a land rich in human history, from ancient Native American settlements to Old West mines and cattle ranches. The magic of Scottsdale's McDowell Sonoran Preserve continues to attract. Whether you seek solitude, sunsets, or physical challenge. A seemingly endless collection of trails carry you into the heart of this special country. The adventures are waiting for you. There's more to explore in Scottsdale's McDowell Sonoran Preserve. All right, quite the place. How many people have had a chance to hike in the preserve? Yeah. Oh, that's great. There goes my notes. <laughs> In my chair. <laughs> um, Scott is a gentleman who gets to spend a lot of time out in the preserve. And uh, Scott, talk a little bit about uh, what your job is, your role, and, and what you, what you kind of see out there. All right. Thank you, Mike. Let me first, before I forget, down here on the corner of the stage, I did bring the trail maps for the preserve. I got two big stacks down here. So feel free afterwards, come down and grab them. It shows you that vast trail system the video was talking about. Uh, but my job specifically, I'm the planner for the preserve, so on a specific basis, it's, it's quite varied. I could find myself out uh, doing field walks with Helen on you know, research plots in the preserve first thing in the morning, uh, working on trail projects, trail layouts, and then uh, at night doing presentations to the uh, preserve commission about policy issues doing panels like this, so uh, it's actually what I really love about my job because it's so, so varied. But in the broader sense, and I think you'll hear a theme today from all of us, it, the preserve is all about balance. Uh, we do have the preserve ordinance which sets out, sets out management objectives for the preserve, and when you read through it, it's a lot about protecting, protecting habitats and plants and animals and scenic views and cultural resources. And then the other half of it is about providing access. I mean, after all, the preserve was created by uh, the citizens of Scottsdale. 
They tax themselves to purchase it, so access to it for uh, numerous recreational pursuits, hiking, mountain biking, horseback riding, rock climbing, educational studies, uh, of course support for the, the tourism community are all important things. So all of the planning that we do is really about balancing those two sides of the equation, and you'll hear some more details today about how we do that. You're a busy guy. And the city actually has uh, just a few full-time staff members that are responsible for oversight in the preserve, but the city has a lot of help. And uh, that's where Helen and the McNall Snoring Conservancy comes in. Helen, talk a little bit about the Conservancy, its, its mission, and, and your role with it. Thank you. So um, I'd like to say that the Conservancy has a relationship with the city uh, to protect uh, the preserve, and we are a nonprofit that is actually separate from the city of Scottsdale, although we have this partnership. The Conservancy mission, I'm going to read it, is um, the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy champions the sustainability of the McDowell Sonoran Preserve for the benefit of this and future generations. As stewards, we connect the community to the preserve through education, research, advocacy, partnerships, and safe, respectful access. Uh, we have uh, over 600 volunteers we call stewards, um, and those stewards put in um, over 57,000 hours last year um, and help in patrolling and man maintaining the trails on the preserve. We also have educational programs and le um, guided hikes, as well as the research um, program, uh, which I oversee. Thank you, Ellen. And Rachel, you're from the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Tell us a little bit about um, what that is and why, why the desert plays a role in that. Sure, thank you, Mike. Um, for the Convention and Visitors Bureau, our responsibility is to brand the destination. So we're the organization that is marketing Scottsdale to the world, um, encouraging leisure visitors, meeting planners, or groups to choose Scottsdale for their next vacation, meeting, or event. Um, and really for us, the Sonoran Desert setting, that lush desert setting that we have that is so different from other deserts, is an incredible unique differentiator for us. It sets us apart from the competition. And we like to think that if, if you think of Scottsdale's bustling downtown as the heart of the city, the Sonoran Desert is really our community's soul. It's a fabric of our community. It's part of what makes, um, makes us Scottsdale and makes us who we are. And what do we hear from visitors about the desert? What, what do so, somebody who's new to this area, maybe experiencing the Sonoran Desert for the first time, what's the kind of feedback that the CVB gets? Well, our visitors love the desert, but they have lots of different kinds of experiences with it. We have those visitors who come here ready to kind of get into the desert and touch and feel. Of course, no touching the cactus, we tell them, but um, we want them to be out in it. They're, they want to hike. They want to bike. They really want to experience it firsthand. But we know not all visitors pack their hiking boots. They don't all come with their sneakers. In fact, most of them just come with flip-flops. Um, and so we, for those visitors, they're looking for another kind of experience. How do they still get out in the, into the desert? And so for them, it may be doing a hot air balloon ride over the desert where they see it from above. For somebody else, the desert is a little bit of a scary place, and so they want to keep arm's length from it. So perhaps they want to just learn about it, understand it. They might find a place like the Desert Botanical Garden where they can learn about the desert plants, the right kind of experience for them. And still we have other visitors who will simply be content with seeing it from afar as they drive along the Loop 101 or enjoy the mountain view as they're dining al fresco. And for those visitors, that is their desert experience, is to simply look at it and enjoy its beauty. Thank you, Rachel. You mentioned that the preserve for this community is really kind of a Scottsdale soul. And we know from studying it, it's a fragile environment. And uh, Scottsdale and the community is going to kind of reach a milestone here in the next month or so. The city council is going to consider its first preserve management plan. Um, and that's designed to really protect the desert, not only for today, but for future generations to come. Scott, talk a little bit about what's in that plan. Why is it, why is it important? Well, we can actually go back uh, really into the 1990s 
for the plan. What we're, what we're working on now is a compilation of a lot of the different elements of the plan that have been put in place in the past. Um, you know, we started in the early years in the 90s with a land acquisition plan, you know, which land should we use the tax dollars to purchase. Uh, we've had trail plans and trailhead plans. You know, I saw a lot of hands get raised. Uh, you've been out to some of our trailheads and our facilities. So we've, we've had We've had a lot of plans over the years. Uh, what we're doing now is bringing them all together in one place and taking what we have that's existing and combining it with uh, really two additional elements, the, the ecological resource plan, which is the ERP, uh, which Helen has had a lot to do with, uh, has basically uh, Melanie and Hel uh, Helen and Melanie Lucek from the Field Institute of the Conservancy have spearheaded that three-year-long project to create the ecological plan. Helen will talk more about that. Um, what that will do is make sure that all of the other decisions we're making about how we manage cultural resources, how we manage the trails and the trailheads and uh, peripheral activities around the preserve, adjacent development and roadways and things like that, that it's all done in as ecologically sound a way as possible and really uh, basing it on science and having that foundation in science. We know that um, people have a lot of opinions and attitudes about the open spaces. Uh, there's a lot of emotion that can run around it, which, I mean, you saw the videos, there, there's good reason for that. And, you know, we want to address that and manage the preserve with that in mind, but uh, really having that scientific underpinning of the decisions that we make is really critical. Uh, the other large component of the resource plan that is coming together right now is the cultural resource management plan. The preserve has a 9,000 year history of human activity uh, all the way back from archaic wandering bands of people up to, really up to us today, you know, to the ranchers and the more recent activities with the preserve. Uh, so the cultural plan will do a similar thing as the ERP. It will make sure that all the other decisions we're making related to the preserve are done in a way that it's, it's sound and supportive of uh, maintaining and managing the cultural resources. That's a, that's a big job. And, and that's really where the science comes in. So there's an archeological aspect to desert preservation. There's certainly an ecological aspect to desert preservation. And, and Helen, that's, that's, your, that's your ballpark, right? T talk to us a little bit about what the Conservancy is doing to assist with the management plan and, and wh what are you doing on the ground out there? Thank you. Um, first, let me talk a little bit about uh, what the Field Institute is within the Conservancy. We're one of the programs, and we work towards uh, uh, research and monitoring of the preserve. And um, we do that through a unique model of citizen science um, in which uh, citizen scientists are trained at every level of research activity. And so um, they go through a certification process in which they're able to um, produce usable data that we can then um, use in our um, to uh, analyze that data and uh, better understand the resource so that we can make valid um, management recommendations and improve our best management practices. We also partner with scientists uh, from universities and agencies um, that also help us to review um, review our work and to um, help us with experimental design. Um, and we have developed priorities um, over the past year that can help us um, define uh, and understand the ecological condition of the preserve. Now, getting to um, your question specifically about the ERP. Um, the ERP, as Scott said, is the center piece of the preserve ma management plan. And um, it has been a primary focal effort of the Field Institute um, for two years, of the three years it's been um, going on. And um, we started that after um, conducting flora and fauna surveys. Um, the key for the ecological resource plan is that it identifies and describes key elements um, to, that are key to monitoring the ecological condition of the preserve. So to lay it out, um, it has organized um, those conditions um, into uh, subject areas. So the guts of the 
the ERP um, are where it's laid out into plants, animals, soils, geology, water resources, degraded lands. And then for within each of those subject areas, we went into the current state of the resource, um, the primary indicators of change, um, evaluation thresholds, and next steps. Um, and that has, um, that structure has, and information has led us to developing our long-term research and monitoring plan for the preserve. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to point out uh, the map. Why, why this science is so important is the preserve, the Scottsdale Preserve, is really a, a stark interface between really wilderness and man's built environment. There's a lot of intensive uh, activity right on the border of the preserve. And the preserve connects to the Tonto National Forest and the McDowell Mountain Regional Park. And it is a sustainable environment for plants and animals. And, and, and that's important. That, that, that open space is about the size of Connecticut. And so we're going to have deer herds and mountain lions. Um, f hopefully, for, for generation after generation, it's a sustainable environment. And that's why it's important, really, to study it and preserve it. And going back to, to Rachel's area of expertise, allowing the rest of the country to, to really be able to experience a true, unique ecological system. And um, segueing back to, to Rachel a little bit, they're doing a lot of research. They're coming up with a new brand, which I think is going to be unveiled next week. Rachel, talk a little bit about that in the context of the preserve and the desert. Sure. Um, as Mike mentioned, we're rolling out a new destination brand, and that includes a new advertising campaign, new website, um, everything that the consumer would see. So if you're living in Chicago or New York or Canada, and you're seeing information about Scottsdale, or you're coming to our website trying to decide if we're the place you want to go visit, um, we're, we're rolling out a whole new look and feel. And the importance of that is, is the brand for a community is really what you feel when somebody says the name of that company or the name of that destination. And so just as with any major brand, when, when you hear that name, you immediately associate certain qualities with it. And we want people to be associating certain qualities with our brand. Um, but at the same time, people are looking for different things. Travelers have unique needs. Things are changing in our communities. Um, and so we really have to make sure that we're meeting the needs of today's customer. And so while we have this incredible asset with the preserve, we need to figure out how do we connect that asset to what the customer is looking for and what that leisure visitor wants in their vacation. And so through a really extensive 18-month process, uh, we have been working with a research and creative partner, and a lot of that research has revolved around um, what perceptions are of our community, including that desert experience. Um, and we've certainly heard that it is a point of differentiation for us, but it's interesting to hear because from our perspective, we know so well what the Sonoran Desert means, what it looks like, what it feels like to be in it. But sometimes we're speaking to somebody who hasn't been here before. And so they hear the word Sonoran Desert, and you might as well have just said Sahara Desert. They don't know the difference. They imagine, you know, sand dunes, yes, or, you know, tumbleweeds rolling through um, our streets. And so we have to help show them that the desert is this beautiful, inspiring, positive place it's not barren or dry the way some people may envision the desert. And so that's a, a unique challenge that we have, um, but it's certainly something that we know is very authentic to the kind of desert experience that, that visitors can have here. Thank you. And, and without letting out uh, too many secrets, can you talk a little bit about what uh, your, your research has, has found and what direction uh, the brand might be going? Sure. Well, well you'll, you'll certainly see a lot about the desert, which I think is, is good news for, for Scottsdale. Um, some of the research also showed us, in addition to what I just shared, um, people already know that Scottsdale is a good place for a desert experience. So we don't have a lot of work to do there. We just have to continue to showcase it, as I said, through imagery and messaging that really um, shows it as that beautiful place that it is. Um, but what's interesting is that people aren't sure if we're a good place to enjoy the outdoors. 
So we're good desert experience, but they don't know if they can enjoy the outdoors. And that seems completely <laughs> like those two statements don't match, but it goes back to how those visitors are experiencing the desert, that so many people are used to being able to see it, but they don't know how to really get into it, how to experience it. What are those opportunities for them? Um, and so that's a, a unique, again, opportunity that we have and a challenge that we have um, is to not just show visitors you know, it's beauty who understand what it feels like, but how do you really get out into the desert and experience it for yourself? And you, you mentioned uh, all the wonderful, beautiful things that are, that are out there. And I want to go back to Helen now because your, your team have spent a lot of time out in the preserve, learning a lot about the desert and, and talked a little bit of, to us a little bit about what you're learning, what are the kind of the aha moments that you've experienced uh, doing research out in the preserve? Great, thank you. So uh, the Field Institute, um, although the Conservancy is, is celebrating its 25th year, uh, the Field Institute is um, a young five years old. And so um, in the first three years of the Field Institute, um, they, we conducted flora fauna surveys. And so doing that through citizen science, um, we learned uh, how many species of plants, how many species of birds, um, mammals, um, and we did some uh, day flying insects, so invertebrates were also uh, covered. And so we had a good idea about uh, the species we had going into writing the ecological resource plan. Another study that, that has been and more of a long-term study is uh, we've been working on a trail impact study in which we're looking at uh, low use versus high use. So high use would be um, some of the trails at Gateway where there's really high visitation versus some of the um, trails that are farther back maybe at, um, from the Browns Ranch Trailhead. And we're looking at um, plant composition adjacent uh, to the trails. And we're, we're uh, um, we're finding that plant species richness, which is somewhat something like plant um, diversity, is a little bit lower next to the trails, and so when when there's high use, and so those are those are the kinds of things that we'll be uh, continuing to look at. Some of the also some of the um, surveys that we started in our flora and fauna surveys, we're continuing, like our bird survey and our fauna survey. And that information also through the flora and fauna and the ERP has led us into our current um, new priorities that we will be, that we're just launching this year. And those include non-native monitoring and some um, experiments looking at um, uh, removal techniques so we can hone in best management practices, looking at restoration best management practices, um, looking at sensitive species and long-term plant monitoring. Um, so all of these things taken together, we're taking a holistic approach and trying to hit all of our six priorities and, and, and learning a great deal about many aspects of the preserve so that we can continue to protect and continue to inform our management practices. And we do that again through citizen scientists and working with partners at um, researchers at, at universities and also at um, agencies. And, and obvi obviously this research isn't just going to stay in Scottsdale. This is information that we can share with every desert preserve, every desert park in, in this part of the country. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, and part of my position is to oversee that long-term um, research and monitoring plan. And the other part is um, reaching out to partners um, in Maricopa County and the region, and even um, larger than that, to um, further conservation efforts and conservation planning, and also to be able to then uh, share the results that we find and hopefully learn from what others are doing as well. Right, yeah, it makes, makes a lot of sense. And uh, Scott is uh, one of those people on the ground that's going to benefit from that research. A again, you're, you're out in the preserve, you're, you're seeing it every day, you're, you're responsible really for, for its, its care. Talk a little bit about how Helen the cons and the Conservancy's research is going to help you. Absolutely. Um, it's going to be incredibly helpful. Uh, what it's really going to do in the broad sense is allow us to hone what we do 
uh, in the best way that we can. And, and a perfect example that ties right into what Helen was saying and some of the research uh, that, that she and the others have been doing, um, just to set the stage, that block way up north is kind of a flatter area of the desert. Uh, as much as we'd like to think that the desert out here is pristine, it's been used, and some areas used heavily in the past. With the, there's old Jeep roads and trails and scars on the land. Um, so when we come in and create our trail system, which you see in the dark green lines, uh, we try to use those old trails as best we can, but there's just too many of them, so we have to get rid of them. We call, we call it ripping them or revegetating them, reclaiming them. And what we would typically do, you know, and this is a really remote area, is essentially have the guys who are building our new trail with uh, miniaturized excavating equipment uh, tear up the old trail and just, just rip it so that the soil is loosened and we throw old brush and stuff on top of it. Uh, not really much technique to it. Historically, we've just tried to make it look like it went away. Well, we've been out on a couple miles worth of those areas and uh, Helen, working with the city and also with our trail contractors, we tried some different techniques of, um, you know, again, recognizing our limited resources that we have out there. You know, we can't irrigate, we can't plant trees and things like that. Um, so we really had some limited resources, um, and that's still ongoing. There'll be, um, you know, we ripped to different depths on a couple of different areas, and then Helen would be adding um, some seed to those areas, some wild seed at different times of the year to see uh, when it takes the best. And I mean, that's something that as a trail manager and a trail planner, uh, I have cohorts all across the Southwest that would love that information because they're usually managing areas similar, you know, the county park right next door to us, uh, the, the areas over in Phoenix, they have similar goals to us as, you know, of providing recreation, but also uh, being gentle on the land. And it's information like that, you know, if, if it's a matter of, you know what, don't waste your time ripping to 12 inches, only rip it down to four inches and make sure you scatter the seed at this time of year those are perfect things to, to know and understand, and that's what the outcome of, of that research would be. Uh, that's really awesome, and, and I want to go back to a little bit about the, the size of the preserve. I don't know if you caught all the, the uh, detailed information in the, in the video, but that, that preserve is about a third of the size of the city of Scottsdale. It's over 30,000 acres. It's about the size of San Francisco, uh, to try to put it into some type of context. So there's, a lo there's just a lot of of wilderness out there, and, and I I'm always caution not to use that term because it, it, it's, I guess, under the technical classification, really not. It's wilderness. a lowercase w. What, what is that, Scott? <laughs> a lowercase w. <laughs> Very good, lowercase wilderness. Um, so it's big, and, and you can experience a lot of different topography and geography and, and uh, wildlife out there. Uh, there's, it's, it's a very different place. And I want to go back to Rachel for a second and, and talk a little bit. So we're amassing this volume of knowledge about the preserve and we anticipate it's really going to make a difference in how, how we manage it in the future. How do you use that knowledge to familiarize our visitors with what's out there? Well, it's, a, it's an incredible amount of information, um, a wealth of knowledge that we have, but yes, translating that to a visitor experience or how that gets communicated to the visitor is certainly the challenge. Well, the good news is, is that even from the research we just did for our new brand, we know that visitors come here wanting something different from their ordinary. They don't, you don't go on a vacation because you want to do the same thing that you're doing this week at home. You want to experience something new, you want to try new things, um, and so ha they have a desire to learn when they come here and discover something new, and so I think that information is exactly the sort of thing that they want to know. Again, it comes down to how do we translate that into some sort of experience for the visitor. All right, yeah, Make, makes a lot of sense, and uh, I want to throw out a question for everyone, and it re really is looking toward that future. Um, from your perspectives, what challenges do we as a community face preserving that open space? And then what challenges does that open space face moving forward? And uh, Helen, why don't you uh, take that and give us your opinion? Well, in, um, of course, we're in a, an era of changing climate facing um, the um, possibly drought, uh, long-term drought. Uh, also, as an urban preserve, of course, we um, were prone to uh, urban nitrogen 
air pollution, nitrogen deposition, ozone. Uh, we also have um, land use change as some of the areas closer to the preserve um, get developed. Um, and then um, also we have non-native um, plant species um, it, that are providing competition with the native plant species. So those are the greatest risks. But I would say that the there's good news also, is that the preserve is preserved, and uh, the city of Scottsdale is own, owns it and is progressive in managing it. And so there's a, as we continue to monitor and research all aspects of the preserve, that helps us to be able to understand what those changes are and help inform the way that we can adaptively manage. You brought up those non-native grasses, and, and that's an issue that I don't know how many uh, people in the general public are familiar with. Uh, a lot of the grass that we see in the preserve, it, did, it didn't evolve here. It, it came uh, with the, the first European settlers, and it's really created some havoc in terms of the environment and the balance in the preserve. And Helen, would you talk just a little bit about that, and then Scott, maybe pick up, because I know you've, you've dealt with that too. Yeah, so the two um, most significant non-native plant species in the preserve that we're worried about are both uh, Penicetum species. One is buffel grass and the other is fountain grass. And buffel grass um, is uh, really rampant down in Tucson. And um, fortunately for us in the preserve, it's mostly restricted to one uh, major area, although we do see bits of it other places, uh, maybe a couple places actually. Um, <laughs> and fountain grass um, is a really big problem in Hawaii um, and to some extent in California and is not as big of an, an issue actually in Tucson, but we see it a lot in our washes. Um, it does really well, it's very adaptive to um, flushes of precipitation so it can hang out and wait for a good rain. And so those are the two major ones that we're really thinking about. Out, uh, and we, we're going to be launching um, some research studies uh, this year, and, we, and parallel to that, we also are starting to um, both monitor and remove um, smaller populations as well. So we're really um, working with the city of Scottsdale to um, work towards uh, management and control of those species. Thank you. And we don't like it, not just because it's non-native to the desert, there, there are some hazards invo uh, involved with it too. Um, right, Scott? Absolutely, and you know, H Helen's on the science side of it, so I could explain it much better, but um, you know, when you have grasses that are coming in and out-competing the native grasses, um, you know, there's habitat concerns there, uh, and there's fire concerns. You know, the, uh, particularly, I know Helen didn't mention the red brome grass, which there's a reason we don't mention it, because it's, <laughs> it's so widespread. It's a small, low-growing grass that basically carpets the desert there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. You know, the fountain grass and the buffel grass, you could spray it, dig it up, you know, try to really eradicate it, but uh, the red brome is, it's everywhere, and that's what has fundamentally changed the fire pattern that could happen in the Sonoran Desert. You know, now there's a, a carpet of dry grass that can carry a fire across the desert, which, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, wasn't, wasn't there. So it's, it's definitely going to be an ongoing challenge, but setting up, you know, the, the research that Helen is doing, uh, looking at the best ways to be able to, to manage it. Um, I'll just sneak in here. I think Scott did a great job um, describing that. And, and the thing, the worry really is in the Sonoran Desert, uh, the plants are not adapted for fire, as most of you must know. Uh, so that, that compounds um, the risk to the, the native plant communities of, by increasing um, the potential for fire. If we do have fires, then it, it, the recovery is much, much um, longer much longer, and the non-natives can then come back more quickly because they do fine in fire. Scott, any, anything else to add about the, the challenges that you see moving forward? This could almost be a whole session on its own. Uh, since our theme today is science and technology, um, one challenge specifically that I see is um, apps, phone apps. 
related to the preserve. There's a few out there, um, one in particular that a lot of people have started using that allows you to track your route through the preserve and compare your time to the last time that you were on that trail. It allows you to compare your time to other people through you know, the virtual world. And um, you know, it's, it's a perfectly legitimate, valid form of recreation. People love it. Uh, not everybody uses it, but the ones who do really seem to enjoy it. Uh, but what it does is it can some, you're basically racing, you know, and uh, it can change people's mentality of how they're using that trail. Even though they're there by themselves, they might be trying to hike faster, run faster, ride their bike faster than they typically would, which can start to cause uh, some conflicts potentially with other users. Uh, and then another thing that I know I've actually, I saw it on the, the, the schedule for a session today is drones. You know, drones kind of suddenly came out of nowhere. And, um, you know, the city is c considering the ordinance to limit takeoff and landing of them in the preserve. Uh, but you can fly them over the preserve all you want. And to some people, that's a wonderful, fun thing to do. Uh, we've had reactions from other people that they think it's an invasion of their privacy, they're ruining the solitude. We had one guy come off the Pinnacle Peak Trail the other day, he thought it was a swarm of angry bees coming after him and was, was really quite animated about it. So those, there's, gonna, there's always been and will continue to be challenges, particularly in the trail management world as technology changes, as bike technology changes and phone app technology changes. We just have to, to manage and keep up with it. That, that's a really fascinating insight. It's, it's kind of interesting. You get out in the middle of the preserve and it's, there's all the solitude and it, you, it kind of feels like it, it's forever, but things are always changing and you're always confronting new challenges and uh, appreciate that, those insights. And Rachel, uh, I'll turn to you to kind of wrap it up in the terms of looking toward the future. How does this all sync with tourism? Uh, what's, the, what's the future for the preserve going to look like in terms of that kind of economic engine? Well, we certainly hope that the preserve continues with the, the help of these two individuals, continues to be maintained and, and really looked at how do we ensure its sustainability long term. Um, but we know also that for people to want to see it preserved now, we know that we have that. But will generations to come want to see it? And so providing still enough access that people can enjoy it, can understand it, can learn about it, I think through the things at the Field Institute um, is really critical for us so that, that people really understand why it's so special and how it's so different, um, that they want to continue to come back and experience it in all of those various ways that I mentioned at the beginning. Thank you, and, th and thank you uh, for our, our panel, your insights today.